All right, here we are with another episode of Coffee with the Founder. Got my coffee cup and uh, my coffee drink, and I got another phenomenal guest joining me, a good friend, a good brother. Uh, Stefan, what's going on, man? Listen, we're doing these talks. I just want to introduce people to the people in the world, in the community, in the network of the WPC, as well as my network. And so I am so glad you're here. Uh, and uh, I just want to get started by asking you first, tell us who you are and what is it that you do? So um, it, I guess my formal title is I am Dr. Stefan Blandford and I live in Seattle, Washington. I've been here for almost 30 years now and I do a variety of things in nonprofit uh, leadership, in consulting. I do a little bit of teaching um, and am involved in a number of different uh, boards and organizations here in the uh, Pacific Northwest. Yeah, so can you talk a little bit about the nonprofit world? I think if anything that, if, if any place, any space has, I mean, I think, I don't know, taking a hit, so to speak, or being impacted by the time we're in now is the nonprofit world. Can you just talk a little bit about what is the work you do with nonprofits, nonprofit leaders, and what's the state of the nonprofit world today? Well, um, I have a fair sense of some of the challenges going on in the nonprofit world because I work as a, a consultant to nonprofit organizations, also serving on the boards of a few nonprofit organizations. Um, we are grappling, I'll give you an example. So United Way of King County, I serve on the board here of United Way, which is one of the largest United Ways in the nation. We are really grappling with um, challenges around um, rental assistance. Um, lots of folks who are most impacted by um, the pandemic um, are not getting the getting the checks, the stimulus checks that come from the federal government, uh, rent is coming due, and uh, it will have a detrimental impact even more so than we expect if folks are unable to pay rent. So uh, United Way has stepped into the breach along with a number of other philanthropic organizations to um, try to mitigate some of that. And so I've been involved in that. There are other nonprofits that we're counting on um, uh, fundraisers, breakfasts and lunches during the springtime that all got canceled. And they are struggling mightily um, at a time when the need has gone up. So there are more clients who are in desperate need of their services, but their revenue streams have, have been pinched uh, down to, to zero. And so um, I've been part of a group that has been trying to articulate and get that message out to philanthropists across our city. Um, it, we're very fortunate in Seattle in that there's a lot of wealth that's been created here and people who have a sense of um, connection to the nonprofit community. So I'm trying to be a bridge in between those who have and can give and those who are desperately in need. Yeah, yeah. Well, as an executive director of a nonprofit myself, I'm wondering, um, as a consultant, from your vantage point, what is it that you would say to someone like myself, a leader of a nonprofit during this time, in reference to the importance of leaders in crisis? Um, have folks reached out to you? And what kind of advice are you giving folks about I mean, I think leadership in general is a challenging thing, but leading in crisis, I think, is a really kind of unique dynamic we're facing today. Right. Well, we talked a little bit before about um, trying to see opportunity in the crisis. And uh, with folks that I'm talking to, I'm trying to get them to um, think beyond the, the immediate crisis. And some of them are so caught up in what's happening in the moment that it's difficult to get them to see beyond. But, um, you know, there are already lots of conversations, things you see in the media about trying to imagine what the world could be. And um, when I hear people talking about 
let's get back to where we were. I try to uh, talk to my clients and talk to people that I work with about why don't you reimagine the world the way that it you should it should be rather than let's just go back to the days before the crisis arrived. And that is that allows people to think about um, how do we remessage the value of our uh, theory of action for our nonprofit organization? Uh, what it's, what's one thing that we wish we had done that maybe this time gives us the opportunity to, to explore? Um, who are donors that are willing to engage with us and stay with us through this? And how can we engage them about a bigger vision for this particular nonprofit or that particular nonprofit? And so just trying to get people to um, think bigger than uh, the moment that they're in. And I say that recognizing fully that um, many of my nonprofit colleagues are in the fight of their lives and can't get, can't even think about um, anything other than how do they pay their bills? How do they provide the service to their communities in the moment? Because the community needs are growing almost exponentially. Yeah. Yeah. I think that point you mentioned about some of the fiscal challenges simultaneously with the needs on the rise. It just mm -hmm. seems like a really difficult situation. I'm wondering as you think about as as a consultant, as you think about people reimagining visionary, um, I mean, when you get a call from a nonprofit leader, a nonprofit organizations. Uh, what, you, what are some things that you look for that give you a sense that this organization is a place that you can work with based on your, you know, philosophy, but also just the, the, the health, the, the, the well-being, the longevity, the structural design. Are there some things that you look for before you decide this is an organization I can work with. Yeah. Um, so over time, my consulting practice has moved in the direction of um, racial equity. It's always been there, but it's become particularly focused as I recognize that most nonprofit organizations um, have a huge disparities in their outcomes based on race. If you disaggregate their data, usually their um, clients who are people of color or come from low income communities have much poorer outcomes. And so my uh, practice is specialized in what would a leader do if they wanted to address that issue. And I think that the um, document that I sent out through LinkedIn that you saw, which prompted the two of us to get together, was a, a series of questions that Boards need to ask themselves, boards of nonprofit organizations need to ask themselves if they are leading for racial equity. And it was particularly um, appropriate in this time, given the fact that so many of the nonprofit organizations are seeing an influx of um, low income people and people of color that are walking through their doors that are needing service. And you know, what I've seen more frequently than not for nonprofit organizations is they have a mission statement that says something about racial equity, but they don't know how to operationalize um, the words that are in that mission statement. The document that I shared in my practice is all about how do you lead for equity and how do you operationalize the words that are on that statement and make them real for the lives of um, the community that you serve. Uh, so can you tell us how you got here? I mean, did you grow up saying, hey, I'm going to be really operationalizing equity and nonprofit organizations? No. Give us a sense of how we got here, Doc. Uh, um, it is, it's been a very circuitous path for me to get to where I've gotten to. I come from a family, I think we talked a little bit about hailing from families that were, um, in my case, mired in generational poverty uh, in the South. And my mom and dad made some choices early on in um, my life that gave me access to pretty high quality education. And, you know, growing up in the 60s and 70s and hearing 
uh, MLK and Malcolm and all the civil rights leaders, always felt like that was something that I wanted to spend my life doing if I had the opportunity to do so. So when I moved to Seattle, um, I got a degree in social justice um, and really immersed myself in the theory and practice of um, changing community. And then I got a master's in public administration and a doctorate, um, both at the University of Washington. And um, just felt passionate about trying to figure out ways to improve my community and take what I had learned and share it with others who are trying to improve their communities. So I had the opportunity to um, run for office and serve four years as a school board director in Seattle uh, during the time that my kid has been in school. She's still got a year to go. Um, but I uh, tried to, during the time that I was in office, really push on policies that were going to address the opportunity gaps that we see here in Seattle. And then my um, consulting practice has grown from that uh, with the recognition that um, uh, principals and superintendents would reach out to me and say, what you know is what we need to learn and implement in our districts. And so um, as a result of that, have had several leadership roles that have come my way. Um, and, you know, it's, it's about mentorship. I spend a lot of time working with young leaders, uh, trying to get them up to speed on how to lead for equity and to be unapologetic, but also to recognize that um, you have to meet people where they are and push their thinking, um, particularly if they're in leadership roles. So um, that part has been a pleasure and an honor to be able to um, work with other leaders. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I want to ask you about your leadership advice to young leaders, up and coming leaders that may be watching or listening or may need a, uh, 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 a, a remodeling because times are going to be different. Like you yeah. said, we got to be, we need to be reimagining, visioning in reference to the future. But uh, uh, be, before I ask you that, I wanted to um, get you to uh, talk a little bit more about in the world of education and some of the things that you experienced from being on the board, leading the board. What are you foreseeing are some of the challenges around education as we grapple with this pandemic, this, this shelter in place, COVID-19, so much uncertainty. I mean, as you reflect from a leadership standpoint, what are some things you're foreseeing or uh, thinking about that may be a part of what people are calling the new normal? Um, as a local superintendent um, chafes at the idea of a new normal, she has instructed her staff, my wife is one of her staff members, has instructed them never to use the word new normal or the phrase new normal because um, it conveys that, that, that there's anything normal about this situation and there is nothing normal about it. And even before the pandemic, who would call, who would call the, the um, underfunding of schools? Who would call the, um, the way that we treat children? How, who would call that normal? That's abnormal. Mm. And so she resists the notion that we should call it normal. And I agree with that wholeheartedly. I think that um, you know anyone that's associated with public education knows that the next few years are gonna be tougher than, than anything we have ever experienced just because public funding is, is going to be um, assaulted by more needs and um, there are dollars available and you know revenue is going to decrease tax revenue is going to decrease because many states are reliant on sales tax the sales tax during the time of a pandemic is going to go way down and so you know i think there's some dark days ahead but going back to my prior point about how do we reimagine the world that we want it, want to be and how do we as leaders, particularly, and leaders for equity, reimagine and rearticulate why public institutions should be um, 
acting with equity in mind, so serving those who have not been well served in the past. You know, we have to make the case that our kids and our families and our communities are most in need. And we need to do that in a different way than we have done it in the past so that it, it's not perceived as charity. It's seen, it's perceived as, you know, your reason for existence is to serve uh, these children and families. And if, if that is not the case, if you're not doing that well, then you really don't deserve a paycheck. You don't deserve to exist. And so um, articulating some different arguments for why um, support for our kids and our families and our community is essential. Um, and that's gonna require some bold new leadership. It's gonna require making arguments in ways that we have not made them before, but I think there's great opportunity in that. Yeah, yeah. So what are you saying to young leaders? If, if you have a listening audience, uh, tuning in or you're preparing some words for a group of future leaders. I mean, what's your advice during this time as you think about the challenges, the opportunities of um, really the next level, the next step beyond the pandemic? Well, you know, there's no doubt that the pandemic is, has caused a lot of chaos in society. But um, like I said, along with that chaos, there's opportunity. And the leaders that I'm talking to, and you know, I haven't talked to a huge number of people just because we've all been locked down. But I would imagine that my argument to them would be, now's the time to step up. If ever there were a time to step up, now is the time to do it. And you know, those leaders are connected to their community. Uh, many of the people that I talk to, um, many of those that are in the graduate class that I teach, they are of community. So they live in the community. They were raised in the community. They know it deeply. And um, in many ways, it's time for them to step up and to replace some of what I call the dilettantes, uh, folks who speak for community but are not of community. Mm. Um, it is time to replace them. And many of them will leave just of their own volition but it is time to replace them with people who can speak with authenticity, um, with passion, and with a level of commitment about the communities that they come from. And I think that um, that level of authenticity, it resonates with funders, it resonates with policymakers, and um, there's, there's potential for um, positive change to come from uh, those leaders stepping up into those roles. Well, you mentioned two of my favorite words when it comes to leadership, bold and unapologetic. Absolutely. Um, what I found, however, and what the research is now showing, particularly if you're black, bold and unapologetic, there could be some funding costs, some consequences, or lack of funding, I should say. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm wondering, What's been your, have, have you experienced organizations facing some of these kinds of challenges where they're being bold and committed, unapologetic in their, um, you know, really providing for the most needy in many cases, fighting for those who need uh, some things that are often not provided in the social network, the cost they're paying, and what's your advice to them as we look at again, um, uh, in many cases, or in some cases, maybe even fewer amounts of funding opportunities, yet greater need. Mm -hmm. so, so you have surfaced a real problem, uh, particularly around um, being authentic and being unapologetic. Um, I have seen leaders, I've seen novice leaders that um, promote a, a policy or a position of resentment and with legitimate reason that they are resentful and that resentfulness comes out in their um in their pitches when they're talking to a philanthropist or potential funder right mm. um and i think it's dangerous sometimes to 
allow that resentfulness to poison a potential relationship with a funder. Um, I think it's much more successful if you can uh, demonstrate the potential of the, the, the community that you're serving and how being in partnership with this funder, the community and the funder being in partnership with one another that we can mutually achieve the goals that we've set for ourselves. Um, it, it's a hard thing, particularly in a community like Seattle where there's all this wealth that's being created. Um, for some, I'll give you an example. Recently, I was talking to a donor, um, a guy that is very young, probably in his late 20s, early 30s. And I know from having done a little bit of research that he um, just recently came into a tremendous amount of wealth, right? A tremendous amount of wealth. And he and I ran into each other and we were having a conversation. He said, I want you to come and talk to me about your community and how I can be involved. You know, my pitch could be, so my pitch to him could it be uh, from the, um, from a sense of resentment, you owe it to my community. And I have seen other fundraisers actually use that approach. That approach doesn't work by and large. It, it, it's for that person, it's gonna be off-putting. Um, what I have seen be much more effective is, talk about, is talking about how that person can be involved in transforming the community. And you could see his eyes light up about the idea of, I'm gonna be involved in this thing that you wanna do that is going to um, have a huge impact on this community. And that's much more positive. Um, I, I understand completely how people can be resentful and angry at the income disparities that we're seeing, the, in, the inequalities that we're seeing and do everything that they can at the ballot box and talking to legislators about how to make those changes happen. But uh, ultimately, if you are trying to um, improve outcomes for the community that you serve, um, I think you have to temper some of that with, um, with a, a different way of approaching it. No, that's helpful. I mean, it's it's a delicate balance. It is. It is. And I appreciate you sharing that because I I would imagine. Well, I'll just I know for me, it's always been tough, really, even asking for money in general, mm -hmm. right? And now seeing the recent research, having to balance some feeling like. Well, maybe I wasn't asking in the wrong way. Maybe there was some race, some bias, some, yeah. and not taking that to my next ass, so to speak. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so that's been really helpful. I appreciate that. What I wanted to ask you about is how did you become comfortable asking for money, talking about money, talking with people with money? I mean, was that something you were born with? I mean, uh, what, 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 are you, what, are, what is the advice you give to nonprofit leaders or board members in reference to money, which sometimes can be a really tricky thing? And I think for myself, you know, coming from the same kind of background, just not really having that experience. Yeah. And so just wondering what your thoughts are around that. I was, I was sharing this story with someone recently. Um, when I first became an executive director of a nonprofit organization, um, and I had to make my first ask, it was of a um, very wealthy uh, board member. So someone that was already on our board who was writing small checks. And when I say small, I mean, uh, $5,000, something like that, which was huge for our organization. But his capacity, um, he could have written a $50,000 check just as easy as he wrote a $5,000 check. And um, some, of the, some of his colleagues on the board told me he has capacity. And very fortunate for me, I think, in my nonprofit leadership career, um, 
I reached out to him. We had a couple conversations. At one point he said, Stefan, I think you're the right person for this job at this time. And before I even asked him, he wrote a $50,000 check. And what I come to realize, even more important than that $50,000 at that time, was it gave me a level of confidence that I could have this conversation with someone that my mom and dad couldn't have imagined mm. um, having a conversation with some white guy, right? And asking them for a big check like that. But fortunately, my first ask was a successful ask. And it made it a whole lot easier for me to, to make the third ask and the fourth ask and the fifth ask. What I have coached um, novice executive directors to do is to figure out how they, um, ultimately, you have to dispel the myth in your mind that you're making the ask for yourself. You're not making it for yourself. You're making it for the organization. In my case, I was making it for the uh, thousand kids that were enrolled in the Boys and Girls Club that I led. I wasn't making it for myself. Maybe a little bit of it ended up in my paycheck, but the majority of it was going to serve their interests, mm. right? And then it becomes a whole lot easier to do it. When I was running for office and I had to uh, raise the budget for my campaign consultants and yard signs and all the rest, I realized I wasn't raising it for me. I was raising it so I could go and do good work on the school board. Yeah. And if you are, um, if you are making asks um, that are associated with the nonprofit that you lead, you should feel very comfortable that you're not making those asks for your own personal benefit, but for the community that you serve. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, what has this pandemic taught you about you? You've, uh, we've all had kind of our uh, cars put in park by the emergency brake, so to speak. Mm. and possibly had to do some introspection. And uh, I'm just knowing you a little bit and, and knowing you have vision and reimaginary kinds of thinking in your blood, in your veins, I'm assuming you've been introspecting. <laughs> so give me a sense of what's, 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 what's this time in quarantine taught you about you? Well, um being in the middle of it, I feel like I'm in the middle of the river, and at the, at the moment, it's really hard to um, to have that time for reflection, even though I have a lot more time. I feel like I'm in the middle of it. Um, I will tell you that as a school board director, um, I discovered that I was a lot more pugnacious than I thought I was. Um, that I would be willing to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with uh, fellow school board directors that didn't care about racial equity in the way that I did. Um, and over time, I have, as I've refined my own personal mission statement, I know that uh, racial equity is something that I care very deeply about. I know that there are communities full of uh, brilliant scientists and entrepreneurs and teachers and but those communities don't get a chance to and those individuals in those communities don't get a chance because of the color of their skin and because um, our institutions don't serve them very well and so it, it's become a personal mission of mine to try to address and confront um, those who um, allow those institutions to continue to exist and serve people in disparate ways that they do. And so um, mine is a constant um, exercise of self-reflection and trying to figure out how to do that better, trying to learn from my past mistakes, and there are plenty of them, um, but trying to um, wake up every day and be able to do better for the communities that I care about. So as we get towards the end, I was going to ask you, what's on the horizon, the next 10 years? What's, 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 mm. what's in your plans? What are you thinking about? What, what do you got cooking? Anything you're excited about as you look at the next decade? Well, um, some, of, some of my prior commitments as far as um, 
school board is over now. I'm done with that. Um, United Way is coming to a conclusion. And I think uh, I've been fairly successful in helping um, my colleagues on the board and in the leadership of United Way to see racial equity as um, existential to the organization, that it is, it is the reason that we exist. And so I feel good about progress that's being made on that. Um, there is no shortage of opportunities academically, um, you know, in leadership ways. I, I feel like as a consultant, I have been um, not as much in the game as I might like to be. So I'm anticipating a shift into more direct service uh, leadership. Uh, and I'm excited about that. And then advocacy. I think uh, going forward, if we're not advocating in our city halls and our state legislatures, and hopefully at the federal government level, at some point we'll be able to um, have voices that, that uh, can speak and people who want to listen, um, it's going to be imperative that, uh, particularly for communities that have been underserved, that we rally in ways that we never have before because there are gonna be increasing pressures on those legislative bodies. And if we don't have a seat at the table, then we'll be the meal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I've just been doing these lightning rounds, just random questions to ask people to respond in 30 seconds, 45 seconds topics. Um, and so I'm going to just give you some off the top of my head. I'm going to start okay. with um, Jamal Car Crawford or mm. uh, Jason Terry. Who are you going with? <laughs> That's great. I, uh, believe it or not, the Rotary Boys and Girls Club that I referenced as my first executive director, both of them played at the Rotary Boys and Girls Club when they were young, along with three or four other NBA uh, players. So I know them well. Uh, well, I don't know them well. I know of them. Um, I would go with uh, Jamal Crawford. Longer career. Um, yeah. Six man of the year several times. Yeah. 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 All right. So are you rolling with um, Tina Turner? Are you rolling with Aretha Franklin? Oh, Aretha. Yeah, Tina's Tina's got her moments, but Aretha's had a career that when I was a little teeny kid, uh, before I was born even, my mom loved Aretha. Okay, okay. So, yeah. Are you going with Sir Mix-a-Lot or Quincy Jones? That's an interesting one. Uh, Quincy's had the longer career, has been more influential. Sir Mix-a-Lot, back in, what was that, 92? Had the number one record in the nation. Um, and because my kid goes to the school that Quincy went to, I'll go with Quincy. You're gonna go with Quincy. Uh, are, you <laughs> going with, are you going with um, Michael Jordan or LeBron James, the best oh, in the land? That's a tough one, that's a tough one. Um, if you had asked me before, the um, the last dance came on. I think I might have gone with with LeBron, but watching that and it, it brought back fond memories of how dominant MJ was back in the '90s. There was no one that could touch him, and I don't. I still don't think there's anyone that can touch him. Mm. Are you going with Michael Dyson? Or are you going with Cornell West? Oh, that's a hard one. That's a hard one. Um, I, I believe that, uh, Cornell is, he is academically insightful. Um, Dyson is also academically insightful, but he is, um, he is much more down to earth. I can live with either one of them. And, and anyone who, anyone who's listening, if you Google, um, Cornell West's uh, speech inducting uh, Colin Kaepernick. 
at Harvard, you should listen to that speech. It is one of the most incredible things I've ever heard uh, a speaker give. Mm. Yeah, I got to keep you going with, uh, I got to keep that in my Angela Davis or Maya Angela. Oh, <laughs> uh, Maya. Yeah. 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 And I love Angela Davis, but um, I've been more inspired by and uh, by my Angelou's writings than almost anyone I can think of. Yeah, we been asking people lastly, what have you been watching, reading, listening to? Is there anything you picked up in the last 60 days plus, or uh, you excited about that you'd like to share to add to our list, what to watch, what to read, what to listen to during the pandemic? So I have read, uh, a number of books by African American artists during, or African American writers, during the um, the lockdown period. I just pull out a book that I've read before and and go through and look at my notations. And um, recently, I was talking with a friend of ours, Malia Lacour. Yeah. And um, I said we need to have a book group. So we start, she and I and a few other friends of mine are starting a African American writers book group. Um, and we start next Wednesday. And this is the first book that is on our, on our list. And both of us, both of us have struggled to finish it, but we've gotten about a, a third. I'm in. Count me yeah. in from out of town. I'm in. <laughs> I, I would welcome you. All right, and, uh, send me the details. I'm in because I need to get in too, and it's be nice yeah. to join with some friends. Yep, and and particularly for those of us who are readers and people of color, I think there's a unique uh, take on it that I'm looking forward to exploring with my friends. Yeah. So yeah. we start on Wednesday. All right, all right. I'm in. I'm in. All right. Well, listen, bro. I'm so glad we were able to connect to get you on, and I've always appreciated you uh, as a friend, as a colleague, as a brother since the time we met. Yes, you welcomed me to the 206 and uh, even helped me out with my golf swing. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> it was great talking with you, Eddie. All right, man, you'll be safe. I'm gonna be in touch with you as I okay. continue to try to expand as a nonprofit leader because I could really continue to use some insight and some guidance, so I'm gonna reach out. Okay. We got to take care of each other. All right. I appreciate you, bro. Take care. Take Peace. Care. Bye.